All right, John Bolton was the U.S. ambassador to the U.N., and he also served as the national security advisor to former President Trump, and he also is the author of the book, The Room Where It Happened. Hello, Mr. Ambassador. Hi, good morning. Glad to be with you. John, you know, you just wrote an article in the New York Post. I know you do a lot of editorials, but that when you said in a stroke, Biden demonstrated he didn't understand his own Ukraine policy, undercut, undercut Kiev's government and people, and handed Moscow an engraved invitation to make a minor incursion into Ukraine. What, what do you mean there, a minor incursion? Well, that, that of course is Biden's term where he said it's, it's one thing if they do an all out invasion, but on the other hand, if it's just a minor incursion, then NATO won't know what to do. Now that happens to be unfortunately an accurate statement as we've seen from the evolution of Germany's position. Uh, there's hardly NATO unity here, but it's certainly not what a president of the United States ought to do. And he certainly ought not to appear to condone any kind of incursion into Ukraine. But then he did clarify that afterwards where the White House came out with a statement and said any, and then I think Mr. President Biden said, also said it a couple of days later, he said any movement of those massed troops on the border into Ukraine would trigger you know, massive retaliation in terms of sanctions. Yeah, well, you know what they call a, the definition of a Washington gaffe? It's when a politician inadvertently tells the truth. And I think what we had here was Biden inadvertently perhaps saying what was on his mind. And, you know, when you come to clean it up later, uh, it simply feeds into the confusion about exactly what we're intending to do. I mean, I think the NATO position here is becoming less clear as time goes on. Uh, we have Biden again uh, within the past 24 hours saying uh, no further U.S. forces are going to Ukraine. This is another unforced error, e even if that's the correct policy. Uh, you don't give it away for free, in effect. So I think, unfortunately, the momentum, the initiative here still rests with Putin. Uh, I don't think, actually, he's made a final decision what he will do, uh, but he's looking to gain the maximum advantage, whether it's just in Ukraine, whether it's more broadly in the space of the former Soviet Union, or whether it's aimed at NATO, still looking to get what he can at the lowest cost. If you were advising the president, what would you say he has to do right now? Because you, you've criticized him in the past, of waiting for Putin to move first is sure to backfire. Right, what, what the deterrence that he and NATO have tried to create in Putin's mind is threats of punishments that will happen after Russian troops cross into Ukraine. And he's threatened severe sanctions. That's one way of trying to establish deterrence. The problem is, looking what happened after Russia annexed the Crimea in 2014, after they effectively took control of a big chunk of eastern Ukraine, they suffered very little for it. So I'm afraid in Putin's mind, threats of economic sanctions after the fact uh, do not have a deterrent effect. And I think, again, Germany's continued weakness on Nord Stream 2 and other issues reinforces that. So if you want to prevent the invasion, and that should be the objective, uh, you've, got to, you've got to take steps in the here and now, not threatening punishment later, but doing things that change Putin's cost-benefit analysis immediately. And I will say, in the past week, 10 days, uh, the White House and other NATO members uh, have increased uh, and sped up the flow of uh, lethal military assistance to Ukraine. I think that's a positive step. Uh, I do think that NATO has to put additional NATO forces in Ukraine, not to fight, but to continue to train and work with Ukrainian forces, uh, as American National Guard units are already doing now and have been doing for some years. I think those Russian generals looking through their field glasses across the border should see a lot of American flags and wonder, what does that mean? Do they really want to risk a confrontation with the United States? And then finally, uh, I think this Nord Stream 2 issue has got to be brought to a head. Uh, I think uh, if Germany wants to be part of the United West, uh, we need a statement that no natural gas is going to flow through that pipeline uh, until Russia withdraws military forces from places where they're not wanted, not just Ukraine, but uh, Moldova, Georgia, uh, and others where they're currently occupying parts of these countries. What do you think about placing troops permanently in the Baltics? I mean, right now, a lot of people don't realize that those battle groups, multinational battle groups are rotated. They do not have bases in you know, Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania. Um, now there's some talk that you know, President Biden has put 8,500 
troops on standby, maybe to go in and reinforce reinforce the, the Baltics, could be the 82nd Airborne, for instance. Do you think it's time now to talk about really stepping up and putting bases there uh, and, and drawing a, a, an absolute, clear, very visible sign for Russia that they cannot go back and roll back any NATO membership? Yeah, I think it's worth reinforcing. You know, uh, Russia or the Soviet Union has never sent military forces across the NATO border. Uh, and I wrote the other day, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania ought to be thanking their lucky stars that they got into NATO before Europeans and Americans began to get cold feet over it. George W. Bush proposed bringing Ukraine and Georgia uh, onto a fast track for NATO membership in April of 2008. France and Germany rejected it. In August, Russia invaded Georgia, August of 2008. Uh, so I think stronger steps to show the Baltics and to show Russia that the commitment is real or warranted. You know, it's uh, over, over the decades, the distinction between a military base uh, and uh, troop rotations has gotten pretty thin. Uh, when you preposition uh, supplies and equipment uh, in forward places, the, rotate, the rotation of the troops uh, really becomes functionally equivalent to a base. But calling it a base, having the flag up uh, 365 days a year, uh, I do think it has political significance. I think we ought to think of ways to to underline that political support for these for these endangered NATO members. What do you say to Russians? And I'm sure you probably heard it directly, and to President Putin, who say promises were broken. We were told that NATO would never expand when uh, U.S. Secretary of State Baker met with Gorbachev. Although a lot of people say that they were talking about East Germany at the time, and the fact that there were Soviet troops there and and Baker was really saying that they wouldn't push NATO forces into East Germany while Soviet troops were still on the ground. But there's different interpretations. Were promises broken? No, they weren't. I worked for Jim Baker at that time. Uh, and I remember this controversy arising. The, the point he made to Gorbachev was we will not insert American or other NATO forces into East Germany while then still Soviet forces were still there. In other words, not risking a confrontation unintentionally, uh, because the Soviets were not able to withdraw from Germany as quickly as they wanted to. They didn't have the capability to withdraw. Uh, but there was never any commitment not to treat Germany as a completely uh, integrated country after the East and West were united. And, and all of Germany became a NATO member, not just half of it. Uh, nor were, were there any limitations on eastward expansion. You know, the first addition from the Warsaw Pact was Hungary. And I remember that very well. It, the Hungarians, as early as 1990, were coming to people like me in the State Department saying, we don't want to be part of the Eastern European group at the United Nations anymore. We want to join the Western group. I mean, that's how fast things were moving. So, you know, this is a little revisionist history by, by the Russians. Uh, and uh, they may not like the expansion of NATO, but they were never promised it wouldn't happen. But NATO's threatening them, John, they say. And you, you were there in the White House when the U.S. withdrew from the INF Treaty. I believe you were in the White House at the time, right? And you were a proponent of withdrawing from the INF. And the Russians would say, well, there, there, goes, there goes, you know, open skies. There goes another agreement that the U.S. Uh, is tearing up. But in fact, what was the reality in terms of the intelligence that you had? Is there any doubt in your mind that Russia was the one that was violating the, the INF? Right. You know, at the time, uh, I, I have long been a supporter of getting out of the INF, and, and I'm happy to say the Trump administration did withdraw. Uh, at that time, there was only one country in the whole world, one country that was bound by the INF Treaty, and that's the United States. China wasn't bound by it. Uh, Iran, North Korea weren't bound by it. In theory, Russia was, but they had been violating it for 12 or 14 years. They had previously deployed INF violative missiles in the Kaliningrad exclave uh, between Poland and uh, Lithuania. So the history was Russia had violated it very significantly for a long period of time. We faced threats from China, which has a huge uh, rocket force in the intermediate range. Uh, and in those circumstances, given we were the only country in the world, I mean, think about that for a minute, we were the only country in the world not building intermediate range missiles, uh, it, was, it only made sense to withdraw, had no offensive uh, uh, aim toward, uh, toward Russia, and uh, uh, it is a fact, it's not just a, a, 
a PR statement. It is a fact. NATO is a defensive alliance, and uh, and that is the only purpose it has ever had. If you listen to a lot of assessments, and I know you do, about what Russia might do, not necessarily a, a full takeover over of Ukraine, but more likely, they will push forces into the separatist areas on their border that they have funded, that they have armed, that they have stirred since 2014. If they do a limited incursion, and they'll, you know, of course, they're going to say things like, we are only supporting ethnic Russians there, we are acting as a peacekeeper, as they've tried to suggest through the Minsk Accords, although to, to everybody else's assessment, they've been an aggressor there. What, what would you say is, should the US response be mitigated? Should be any different versus a full invasion than if they just move into those areas, support the so-called rebels, and then you know that's going to lead to some kind of annexation anyway? Yeah, well, I'm very worried that's exactly what Putin may do. I think he's got all his options open. He, he, may, be, uh, he may be content with a diplomatic outcome that increases the splits in NATO. Uh, he may be looking somewhere else. This may be a shell game, and we're looking for the P under one walnut shell, and he's off doing something else in Georgia or Belarus or some other place. Uh, or he may have less than uh, all-out annexation of Ukraine in mind. And this could come in a lot of different fashions. He could come in and uh, simply occupy and or annex the eastern and southern parts of the country where there are a lot of native Russian speakers. He might try to landlock uh, a rump Ukrainian state, take the port of Odessa all the way up to Romania and Moldova, or he could do less than that. Uh, he could uh, launch Russian forces from Belarus south into Ukraine to approach the capital, Kiev. The Russians did something similar when they attacked Georgia in 2008 to try and topple the Zelensky government. Uh, so he's got a lot of options. But if, you, if, if I had to bet right now, uh, I would bet that some additional substantial part of Ukraine is what he has his eyes on, because he doesn't believe that the post-military action sanctions will be very strong for the reasons I think you're suggesting the Germans and others are going to say, oh, is that all there is? That's not so bad. And he will escape. And that's a bad lesson for Putin to learn. Should the U.S. support some kind of guerrilla movement then to retake those lands, support U Ukraine to fight back and take that, that land back eventually? Yeah, I think we should look at that very seriously. I think, though, the way Putin structures the territories that he takes over could be important if he is in areas that, uh, for example, in previous Ukrainian elections have strongly supported pro-Russian candidates, I think he's not going to face much of a guerrilla threat. I think it's more in the western parts of the country where people would resist. But it's, uh, uh, th this really is speculation. That one thing I agree with Joe Biden on when he said the other day, the final decision here is going to be entirely Putin's, and we just don't know what it is. Ambassador John Bolton, it's always a gift to have some of your time, and I really appreciate your insights, sir. Well, thanks very much for having me. I enjoyed it.